I said to ChatGPT, create an image of a 40-year-old dude, legend, that's got a full head of hair and one that doesn't. So, you know, for me, I don't really give a shit about having hair because I'm going to provide a case study here today of my son who's got a full head of hair and he's just about 30 and I started to go bald at 16. And four different providers, genetics, we've got the same average risk of alopecia, okay? So what... How come he's got a full head of hair and I don't? Well, we've got other genes that impact hair loss, and I'm going to show you exactly what they are today. A lot of my clients do not want to go bald, and over the last four years, I've worked with experts in this space, and I've also done my own research, and what I want to show you here is how to not go bald. So we're going to unpack the big problems, and then I'm going to give you a solution towards the end. So... You don't have to go bald. So basically, in a nutshell, the overview is what you see on screen there. Now, before I move into this, you've got about three, sometimes five years until the hair follicle completely dies off, and then you won't be able to regrow your hair. So basically, you've got over here, inflammation is a big driver, and I'm going to talk about how to get your inflammation in check and what it actually should be. And of course, if you've got thyroid issues, hyper or hypo, big problems, and dihydrotestosterone can be a big problem, and the solutions for that too, and I will talk about those. Stress, she's going to take it down. Crappy, shitty nutrition will absolutely, that's, that's what happened to me, and I had no clue. And then some medications can certainly do that. So what we want to do is increase blood flow to the air follicle and, you know, really help it thrive. So it can regrow, do all of those things, increase blood flow, growth factors, all of these things to stimulate hair growth so you'll keep your hair. Now, let's get into the weeds straight away. Let's not muck around. Now, here's one big driver, which is homocysteine. And we're going to talk about homocysteine for a little while. And this is absolutely huge, not just for hair, but for testosterone, blood pressure, neurodegeneration, all of these things. This one is a big one. And not too many physicians check it. And when they do, they'll say that a certain level is okay, when in fact it's not. There's new research out that suggests we need to get it much lower than the cutoff. And I'll talk about what that should be. But as you can see here, patients with alopecia, they've got low levels of red blood cell folate levels. And this plays into homocysteine, which is negatively correlated with alopecia. All right, so I'll show the research on homocysteine and how that plays into hair loss. Now, my homocysteine genes are terrible, and there's 22 genes involved in keeping homocysteine at healthy levels, and we will talk about that today. But a couple of big drivers here is methylation, the MTHF, and also on the MTHF, we've got riboflavin, and I'm homozygous. I need a lot of riboflavin, and we'll talk about that as we progress. But as you can see here, you need good blood flow to the hair follicle and homocysteine at high levels. And again, the system says 14 is okay, and it should be much lower than that. And we'll talk about what that should be. It injures the artery wall and it causes blockages. So your blood pressure goes to shit. So homocysteine has to be brought back down to healthy levels. Another big player, inflammation. So if your CRP is too high, then you're in a lot of trouble. Now, here's a big problem. You would have heard me speak about this previously. When you get your labs checked and you get your inflammation checked, there's a few labs you can get checked, but here's a common one. High sensitive CRP right here. Now, a standard lab will say either three and below is okay or five and below is okay. Now, is that the case? And apparently it needs to be below one. So if you go to your doctor and let's just say it's it's four and he says, you're okay, you're going to go bald. Alopecia is going to set in. Are you okay with that? And there's many ways that you can get rid of this inflammation. And we're going to speak about how to do that today. So we've got to take care of inflammation. Genetics plays into it too. Here's a part of my inflammation genes. I've got a hair trigger for inflammation. My son doesn't. So when I was very young, I had a lot of inflammation and I didn't even know. And as you can see here, inflammation, 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 <laughs> inflammation, and it affects your mood too. It makes you feel like shit. It drives anxiety, depression, fatigue, 
you have up mood swings up and down all over the place. Now, this is what the this is the problem with high sensitive CRP. Now, as I learned from my my good friend Dr. J, who did a five year PhD in hormones and cholesterol, he's also a genetic expert. We need to get it below one, ideally about 0.5, around about that place. Now, here's a standard lab from our clients, about 1.7. It won't get flagged. Now, I also learned from Chris Masterjohn here, he's got a PhD in nutrition science. When it's between one and three, you've got chronic low-grade inflammation. So you're slowly going bald, your testosterone's coming down, your mood's up and down all over the place, you got too much cortisol, you're packing on the fat, you got brain fog, it's driving all of these diseases, cardiovascular, neurological, autoimmune, arthritis, cancer, lupus, fibromyalgia, and fatigue, you're stressed all the time. So we really need to think differently about these blood labs, and I've got information below to download a PDF so you can see all the right labs to get and how to get them in optimal range. So you can check that out. Now back to homocysteine, as you can see here, we've got homocysteine driving all of this all the way down here. And it leads to lesions in your arteries, as I mentioned there before, and also plaque to build up and hypertension. Now at 19, and my, when I first had my homocysteine checked, it was really high. It took me a good six months to bring it back down to optimal levels. And that's because there's 22 genes indirectly and directly involved in homocysteine optimization. And 14 of mine are really bad. And guess what? My son doesn't have that disadvantage. He's only got a couple of genes in that pathway. So his homocysteine was good when we first checked. Now at 19, I was diagnosed with high blood pressure. So high blood pressure, as you'll, you'll soon see, it actually drives alopecia and hair loss. But homocysteine is a big key indicator of that. So hypertension here, strongly associated with androgenic alopecia, right? The male pattern baldness thinning around here. That's exactly what I got. Started thin around here, then the crown started thin out at the back. And it's strongly related. If, if you've got hypertension, According to this study here, it's a 2.2-fold increased risk of androgenic alopecia. And then you've also got homocysteine driving endothelial dysfunction. So that further adds insult to injury. And as you can see here with homocysteine, inflammation, oxidative stress, and it's just driving a whole bunch of gene modifications, epigenetic gene modifications. So we've got to, we've got to fix this big problem. Now, right here, as you can see, this is some of my genes, and this, this plays into nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is going to increase testosterone, and it's, it's also a powerful vasodilator, so better blood flow. Now, when your homocysteine's up, it can also cause erectile dysfunction, homocysteine. So homocysteine here and uric acid, it basically shuts down your endothelial and nitric oxide production and your androgen pathway. So homocysteine, we really need to make sure that this is ideal because it's driving inflammation and oxidative stress. And here's just some typical labs that we see all the time. We've done over 200 dudes now, high. And these ones are actually flagged because you can see here the reference range, 14.5. Now, where should homocysteine be? Well, let's have a look at the research. Now, according to the research, we need to get homocysteine between five and seven right there. And I've got a big database on homocysteine because there's 22 genes involved in that. And we see over and over with the people that we test, about 90% have elevations of homocysteine. And that could be like 18 or it could be like 10, but we want to optimize it and get it to seven and below. So right here, we've got biopterin recycling. So the, the people that know about biopterin recycling, which is in the nitric oxide pathway. So biopterin recycling plays into nitric oxide pathway. So you can see here, I've got genetic problems with biopterin recycling, which triggers the production of nitric oxide. And then I've got three nitric oxide genes. So with homocysteine increased, and I would have had a bit of inflammation and my poor biopterin recycling and my poor nitric oxide genes, is it any wonder at 19, I had hypertension and I started to lose my hair. So this is a big reason why. 
And there's more. There's a lot more that can drive into hair loss. So again, 22 genes involved in keeping homocysteine at optimal levels. We've also got the methylation genes, the MTHF. We've also got riboflavin, and we've got all of those genes that I just mentioned there. Now, here's a, a publication, and this is, you can do your due diligence and search for this, but homocysteine will lower all the enzymes that produce nitric oxide and vasodilation. Again, vasodilation is great blood flow. So let's have a look at vitamin status because this is huge. Now, this is what's called transsulfuration. And there's, there's two really important things, well, actually three really important things here. So alopecia here, hair loss, we've got homocysteine elevations, low folate, and also CRP. So remember back to CRP, high sensitive C-reactive protein. If we don't get it below that one there, we've got a big chance of going bald. Now, if you've got poor vitamin and mineral status, your homocysteine here will go up, right? And let's just have a look at the vitamins and minerals just in transsulfuration. This one pathway here, B6, B6, iron and zinc, molybdenum, B1, B6. We've got magnesium. We've got energy, so you need energy to have this pathway optimized. Selenium, copper and iron, copper, zinc, manganese, molybdenum, zinc, ma magnesium, 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 NAD, which is really important to make sure that we've got optimal levels. So you can see that if we don't have optimal vitamins and minerals, it's a big problem. Now, let's just get rid of this here. Now, what slows this pathway down is what's called perinitrite. So this is a metabolite that can go up when you've got oxidative stress. We've also got TNF-alpha here and really high levels of testosterone. So you see guys that are on steroids, they've got really high testosterone levels. It slows down this, homocysteine goes up and their heart suffers, their, their hair suffers, everything suffers there. And that's why they get a lot of heart disease and lose their hair. And we've also got Check this out, insulin. And insulin will cause alopecia. Dr. Ken Berry, when I, I spoken to Dr. Ken a few times, and this is what he said about insulin resistance and diabetes with hair loss. If you're a man in your 20s or 30s and you've got a receding hairline, you need to listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. Most doctors will tell you this is genetic. There's nothing you could do about it, but there's actually quite a bit of research that shows without much of a doubt that a, an early receding hairline is due to hyperinsulinemia, also known as insulin resistance. Now, when you get to be in your 50s, it's okay to have a little recession. But when you're in your 20s, 30s, and even early 40s, you should not have a receding hairline. And this is the research on insulin resistance, and it's driving a lot of these pathologies. And before I talk about these pathologies and where you should have your fasting insulin at, this is Dr. Mark Heyman, and he's just speaking about the negative consequences like testosterone, heart disease, cancer, when you have prediabetes or insulin resistance. Sure. We know clearly that pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, many of the common cancers, pancreatic cancer, are caused by something called insulin resistance, which is prediabetes or poor metabolic health. 93.2% of Americans are in poor metabolic health meaning they have some form of prediabetes or insulin resistance. They have high blood sugar, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, they're overweight, or they've had a heart attack or stroke. And that poor metabolic health is driving all these conditions, whether it's cancer, heart disease, diabetes, dementia, depression, infertility, so many different things, even acne. The, our, our food system is the biggest killer on the planet. Our food system, yeah. So if you have a look here, we're talking about hypertension. Now, we know that hypertension causes that, but also cardiomyopathy. And then your fat cells are leaching inflammation when you have insulin resistance, so it's further driving hair loss. Then you've also got glucose intolerance in the muscles, so you feel weak. And then it's screwing up your liver, your central nervous system, so Alzheimer's, memory decline, a lot of cancers, chronic kidney disease, and if you're a lady, polycystic ovary syndrome. So when you get your labs done, very, very rarely will your physician even check fasting insulin. If they do, here is the big, big problem. 
I'll say between 2.6 and 24.9, you're good. Where in fact, if you want to be optimal, you need to get it between two and five. Now, we see this with the men that we help. Once we get it down to about eight, your testosterone comes up, your energy comes up, the brain fog lifts. So labs are absolutely key. And I've got a PDF that you can download to find out the right labs to get checked and their optimal range, which is absolutely key. And a little bit more in a little bit more about insulin resistance here. So it's driving a lot of inflammation, and we now know that it's going to cause that receding hairline and alopecia, male pattern baldness as well. Heart problems, atherosclerosis, kidney disease, stomach cancer, colon cancer, breast, pancreas there, and inflammation. So you're going to have less blood flow to the hair follicle. You're going to be absolutely crushing your ability to keep your full head of hair. So that's a lot of the problem right there. Now, the hair follicle here, what's really interesting is that insulin resistance causes endothelial dysfunction and hypertension, right? So you've got narrowing of the blood vessels to the hair follicle here. So the blood vessels here, they're basically being starved because you've got that insulin resistance, so you can't basically feed the hair follicle so it will regrow. So that, that insulin resistance is going to drive into it heavily. Another big important player in hair loss is, as we now know, oxidative stress and inflammation. Now, a lot of the people that we test have elevations in ferritin, which is a marker for how much iron your body's storing. Now, again, here's another problem with the current system. The reference range is between 30 and 400, and I've even seen it as high as 500. Now, where should ferritin be? Well, according to functional medicine, it should be between 50 and 100. Now, here are the consequences of having way too much ferritin. So listen very carefully to this one here. Now, when you have so much iron in circulation, the plasma iron binding protein, the transport called transferrin, becomes saturated. And when this happens, iron begins binding to other things such as albumin, citrate, acetate. And this iron is referred to non-transferrin bound iron. And when this happens, cells will take up this non-transferrin bound iron into the liver, for example, the heart, the pituitary glands, the joints, the pancreas, as well as the gonads. And here they undergo biochemical reactions, which creates reactive oxygen species, which in turn causes tissue damage, inflammation, and fibrosis. So for example, in the liver, it can cause cirrhosis. As well, it increases the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. In the heart, it can cause restrictive or dilated cardiomyopathy as well as arrhythmia. In the joints, it causes arthritis. In the pituitary glands, when you have iron he depositing here, it can cause secondary hypothyroidism or secondary hypogonadism. In the pancreas, the deposition of iron can cause diabetes mellitus. In the gonads, it can, obviously, it can cause testicular atrophy amongst many other things. So it's affecting all of those organ systems and causing a lot of oxidative stress, hypertension, inflammation, and it's going to crush your testosterone as well. As you can see here, you've got infertility, sexual dysfunction, low testosterone, okay? And all you got to do is donate blood. So get your ferritin checked, and I've got information below on that PDF about how to get your blood, uh, blood labs checked, where to get them checked, and what the right ranges are. So let's just quickly finish up on homocysteine here. So we've got to get homocysteine below seven, seven and below there, like nine at a pinch. And it can take six plus months to bring it back down to optimal levels. And there's 22 genes that play into it. And here's just some of my genes. And I've actually got 14. My son's only got two bad genes. So no wonder he was able to keep his hair and I wasn't. And again, I was diagnosed with hypertension at 19 years of age. They were worried about it then. And by the time I got to my late 20s, they had me on beta blockers. So we're talking about diabetes, kidney disease, cardiovascular, migraines, cancer, bone, eye issues, cognitive decline, hearing loss and fertility, depression, but also lesions, narrowing of the artery wall. And you've also got this. 
So your endotheliols are not working very well. And that's the protective lining of all your arteries. And to make matters worse, you have ENOS uncoupling, which is nitric oxide. She comes down. So you've got hypertension, poor blood flow to the hair follicle. And you've got decreased non-enzymatic antioxidants like glutathione, B12, vitamin E. And you've also got impaired enzymatic antioxidants as well. We're talking about glutathione, SOD, and catalase. Now, I just I want, I want to quickly just and briefly talk about one important thing genetically that's going to drive a lot of heart disease, inflammation, and oxidative stress. If you've got a poor functioning S od2 gene that's a bad thing listen this is dr j um heart disease yeah so this one gene there's really the two genes here but the, the sod2 gene is not a risk unless her ferritin is high but if her ferritin is high this gene gives her a tenfold higher risk of heart disease which is super high risk tenfold yeah we want that to be zero fold so you got to make sure the ferritin is between 50 and 100, not just 50 to 500 or some kind of crazy nonsense. <laughs> yeah. It has to be optimal, not just normal on this one. So that SOT, SOD2 gene is taking care of inflammation, oxidative stress in the arteries, in the heart. And if you don't take care of that, you're going to have endothelial dysfunction. You're going to have poor blood flow to the hair follicle and you'll go bald much quicker. And that's one of my genes. So that's another reason what was playing into my you know, really early accelerated hair loss at 16 years of age. And it also tanks glutathione, as we now know. So glutathione, you've got all of these issues here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but it's pretty significant. As you can see, neuro and block brain, immune and cancer, inflammatory skin conditions, arthritis, fatigue, fibrosis, gout, pulmonary dis disorders, pancreas, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So if you have elevations in homocysteine, the glutathione enzyme right there comes down and you will experience all of those issues. And your moneymaker, your brain, homocysteine, oxidative stress, beta amyloids build up, toxic proteins build up, neuroinflammation, neurodegenerative disease, and vascular dementia. So that's how homocysteine is playing into that. And the final thing I'll talk about with homocysteine is if it's up too high, too long, I'll hyper homocysteine here. You, you, you smooth, your arteries are actually a smooth muscle and they get larger and they hypertrophy. So you've got you know, narrowing of the arteries there. So you really want to get this problem solved as soon as you can. So that is the final thing on homocysteine. So homocysteine here, a risk factor for all of those, these pathologies, cardiovascular. So you're not going to get a lot of blood flow to the hair follicle, the nervous system, the brain, the sensory organs, the hair follicles, the gonads, right? It's going to take out your endocrine system as well down here, endocrine system, skeletal, and also the kidneys there. So that was actually me at 17 years of age. And you can see here, I was trying to hide it, but I was thinning around there. <laughs> I was really trying to hide it there. And she was thin up the top of the crown there. So that was me at 17 years of age. So I, you can see how I was starting to go bald. And everything that is in my genetics was at a massive disadvantage for cardiovascular disease. So thank goodness I've listened to these experts and I've got all of these important blood mark markers in optimal range. So, you know, because I know this now, if I hadn't known this at 16, I could probably still have a full head of hair, but I'm actually quite okay with being bald. It doesn't bother me at all. So another big driver of oxidative stress and inflammation and also hypertension when well, I first started working with Dr. J four years ago. He did his PhD on sex hormones, as we know, and also cholesterol. He said one of the biggest drivers is glucose. And this study that he pointed me to was huge, absolutely huge. So this was over 22 years of healthy, non-diabetic men. 2,000 of them were tracked over 22 years. And they found that there was, if your fasting blood glucose was over 85 here, you had a high, a significantly high mortality rate from cardiovascular disease. But because it's, it's really screwing up your endothelial and your blood flow, you know, your hair follicles will suffer 
and you'll start to go bald early. And this was Dr. J just speaking to that on a group call with the people that we help. So listen to this. Mainstream doctors say that 100 is okay. I mean, it's really not, is it? Oh, it's insane. It's completely insane. What they do in the medical system with sugar is they wait until you get full-blown diabetes before they like to complain about it because that's when they can start selling drugs. It always goes back to the drug sales and how they're trying to manipulate things for that. <laughs> but you don't want to wait until you get diabetes to pay attention to your blood sugar. You want to be optimized, right? That's the whole yeah. goal in all of this. Exactly. Yeah. So here's another very interesting thing that I learned from Dr. James Don Antonio. So to fix your blood sugar, a great book that you can get is from Dr. James. It's called The Blood Sugar Fix. And this should be able, you should be able to optimize your blood sugar with this. Now, this was shown in 2000, uh, 2008 by O'Keefe. Now, they when you do what's called a postperennial two-hour glucose load, your blood sugar should come back to 87 and below, pretty close to what that study said, 85 and below. And you've got a coronary artery regression. The plaque in your arteries are actually getting cleared away. Now, if it's above that, you start getting plaque in the arteries so you don't have good blood flow. So blood sugar is absolutely huge. Now, one thing that you can do to fix this problem, and I've spoken about this since 2018, I learned all about this from Dr. Rhonda Patrick and also Dr. James Dynecal Antonio. It's what's called the Omega 3 Index. And I'll, I'll talk about how you get that tested. There should be information below. But when the, the fats that we eat in the Western diet, there's way too much omega 6 and there's not enough omega 3. So, oh, hang on, come back on screen there. So, you get out of balance right? That's the key idea. You get out of balance. And when you're out of balance, you've got changed gene expression. So that's not a good thing. Then you've got low grade inflammation. Remember, inflammation is driving hair loss. And then you've got serotonin depletion. So there goes your happy brain. You've got increased cortisol production. Then you've got decreased fluidity of the cell membrane. So everything starts to slow down. And then you've got alterations in the ion channels, enzymes and transporters in your brain for serotonin and dopamine. This is one of the studies that I also found when I was doing my research 2018, 2019. And it's out there if you do your due diligence. So excessive amounts of omega-6 as found in today's Western diet. There's our first key, promotes the pathogenesis of many diseases including cardiovascular, so there's the blood flow to the hair follicle, cancer, inflammation, and autoimmune disease. A ratio of four to one, which is probably about here, was associated with a 70% decrease in total mortality. 2.5 to one reduced rectal cell proliferations in patients with colorectal cancer, whereas a four to one ratio with the same amount had no effect. So we're talking getting closer up to the eight, eight range there. Uh, a ratio of two or three to one suppressed inflammation in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Five to one had beneficial effects on patients with, can with, with asthma. And that, that means a lot to me because my pop died of an asthma attack when I was 16. And in 2017, I thought I was going to not see 2018. I thought I was going to die. So did my wife. There's a couple of scary nights there. Now, here's where it gets interesting. A four, a 10 to one ratio in this range here, adverse consequences. So there's information below to get yours checked and they show you exactly how to get it back here. And it's about 60 bucks. So it's a pretty easy test to protect you from that inflammation and look at the benefits. So there's a lot of research coming out. It's going to help with fat loss. It's also going to help pack on the muscle. So here's two studies here, randomized controlled trial. And this one was done with uh, Dr. Chris McGlory, PhD. And this is him with Dr. Rhonda speaking about that. It's here on YouTube. Check it out. Make sure I've got sound optimized. Yep. Smith, we found that in the Omega-3 group, there was higher rates of protein synthesis, in it, uh, which, would, which would kind of, again, corroborate the mechanisms of action of omega-3s, which is to enhance the pre-synthetic response to daily protein feeding. All right, so it's going to increase muscle mass. It's also going to enhance fat loss considerably. 
And so the reason why omega-3s are so important is you have this overall fat burning machinery in your liver, which is called beta oxidation. And the long chain omega-3s, EPA and DHA, turn on, turn on the genes to make you a better fat burner. So your beta oxidation in the liver goes up. So just sitting, me and you here, we're gonna be burning 20% better our beta oxidation when we're consuming three to four grams of long chain omega-3s per day. During exercise, your beta oxidation goes up by 30% if you're consuming that amount of long chain omega-3s. So you're a better fat burner already by getting those healthy marine fats from like wild salmon. Then you, then you actually consume ALA, which is a ketogenic substrate. And so it's really important to integrate omega-3s because you're getting ketogenic substrates, um, but you're also a better fat burning machine. 20% at rest, 30% doing your hit cardio. Dr. Runda speaking about omega-3 index. In the case of, of Bill Harris's work, he's measuring the omega-3 index in people and then looking at their mortality risk. And what he has found is that people that had a omega-3 index of 4% or lower, they had a five-year decreased life expectancy compared to people that had an 8% omega-3 index. Big difference there, right? Five years life expectancy. But here's the really interesting thing. He also looked at smokers. Smokers that had no omega-3 were like the worst of all. But smokers that had the high level, like smokers that were taking their fish oil or eating fish or whatever it was they were doing to get them up to 8%, they had the same life expectancy as non-smokers with the low, low omega-3 index. So that's huge. You're going to pack on the muscle, drop the body fat, protect yourself from cardiovascular disease, and all of, it, all of this shit here. And it's pretty simple to fix. Information below. Get yourself tested, and they, they give you instructions about how to correct those issues. So basically... What we want to, how we want to think about this is you got to fix your blood sugar. The, another great thing about the omega three index that's going to help fix your blood sugar. And guess what else it's going to do? It's also going to protect you from oxidizing your cholesterol. That's right. So right here, this study, when scientists test out oxidized cholesterol, so the small, dense, oxidized cholesterol, guess what they use? Oh, glucose here, glucose-induced oxidative stress. And what they found was the omega-3s, so you got DHA and EPA. Now, EPA, the case of pentanoic acid, right here, right here. EPA blocks, blocks free radical propagation through the lipid bilate, preventing oxidization and cholesterol domain formation. So you can see here the EPA goes into the, the cholesterol molecule itself, the, the LDL particle, LDLC, and it prevents and blocks that lipid peroxidization and oxidizing your cholesterol. So one of the big problems is that cholesterol, this is it right here. This is an LDLC cholesterol, and it's only got one receptor. Now, if sugar or oxidative stress or homocysteine, for that matter, basically oxidizes that, the body can't use it. So what happens, quite simply, is right here, the oxidized cholesterol, she smashes, just smashes into the endothelium, plaque and foam buildup. Homocysteine can do the same thing there, and that's going to cause hypertension, heart disease, reduce blood flow to your tissues and organs, your hair follicle. So what you want to think about is the fish oil is going to help you protect that, and the oxidative stress and inflammation is going to further mitigate all of those terrible things that modern medicine just doesn't seem to know how to fix. Here is the solution. As we can see, the Omega index is absolutely huge. Now, probably if you're like me, I would have done this too. If you read this timestamps, you've come here and you're just going to look at this. Now, as I've learned, work with a lot of experts, if you don't know the, the consequences of not getting this right, it doesn't drive us to want to fix this. So I do recommend that you, you go over everything that I've spoken about here today, because basically, if you've got poor health, you're going to lose your hair. If you've got poor health, you're going to pack on the weight. If you've got poor health, you're going to get atherosclerosis and heart disease, dementia, memory decline, and it's going to destroy your gut. Now, the gut is absolutely foundational. When I went through my and did my certificate in nutrition, I was just blown away by how critical the gut is. So let's go through this solution right now. So the Omega Index, link below to go get it checked, and they actually show you how to fix this issue and get it back in the butter zone. Now, with the blood labs, I've got a PDF download 
and it shows you all the right labs to get. It's about 26 pages long and all the right labs are there. Now, one critical important thing to understand about doing your blood labs, you've got to have, you've got to prep to get the blood labs done because if you're in emotional stress, it's going to skew everything. So we've got you covered there. This is what we call the V8 Diagnostic Mental Prep. And everything's in there. You can go through the whole checklist right there. So that PDF download is below. Now, the also, we need growth hormone elevated as well. And I'm going to talk about how to do that because it repairs tissues and organs. So another thing that you can consider, as I've mentioned here, that we've all got red flags in our DNA, and I'll probably do another video about that, but you can see mine with inflammation. I've got a hair trigger for inflammation. My vitamin mineral status is terrible. My son, Corey, his is remarkable. I need over double the RDI and a lot of different things, sometimes five times the RDI. And then we've also got things like loss of immune tolerance. I learned this when I was doing all these courses on gut health. And as I mentioned there, poor vitamin and mineral status. So the Omega Index, right? If you've got a big issue with being down here in the red or even the, the yellow there, you, you're, you're really going to have big issues with hair, hair loss there. You, you want to get it back in this desirable range there. So there's information about that below. So it drives a lot of diseases, including cardiovascular, cancer, and inflammatory disease and autoimmune disease. So get that one checked out. And remember, when I spoke about this, it enhances muscle growth, fat loss, and it also protects you from all of those disease states. And again, as I talked about here, we've got to increase blood flow. But this is a profound health benefit because as you've learned now, You've got homocysteine, it causes lesions in your arteries and also blockages to, to, start, to start occurring there. So when your homocysteine is too high, she crashes in here, foam build, builds up, but the same is true with elevations in blood glucose. You've got to optimise your blood glucose because this oxidised cholesterol, the body can't use it. It doesn't recognise it and it gets small and dense. And again, it just crashes into the artery wall there and foam and plaque builds up. And as I mentioned there, a great book to get to fix your dysregulated blood glucose is from Dr. James Antonio, The Blood Sugar Fix. And this, again, I'll just cover this, two hour postperennial glucose load. If you come down to 87 below, you've got a coronary plaque regression. So it's cleaning up this crap in your arteries there. But as soon as we start going up high with blood sugar there, you can see that we're in a we're going towards a disease state. You got reduced blood flow to all your tissues and organs, your brain suffers, you suffer, and you start losing your hair. And another thing that it impacts is testosterone production, because if you've got this oxidized cholesterol, the testes can't use it. And this is how your body makes testosterone. So you've got a region in your brain called the gonadotropin releasing hormone system, and it releases LH, the precursor for testosterone. And this is a Ladig cell inside your testes. So LH goes in, it diverges down these two pathways, and this is a nitric oxide pathway. So if you've got low nitric oxide, you're not making a lot of testosterone. But you can imagine if you've got a lot of oxidized cholesterol here, cholesterol can't go into the mitochondria and be enzymatically converted into pregnenolone, exported out of the mitochondria, progesterone, endostrine, dione, testosterone, and there you've got your free T. And because you've got this stuff building up, you've got reduced blood flow to your hair follicle, right? The blood vessels here, and we start to lose our hair. And insulin plays into that too, as I mentioned earlier there. Now, another reason why you want to get your blood sugar fixed is because if you've got elevations in blood sugar, glucose inhibits growth hormone release, and the same is true with too much insulin. Now, According to Matthew Walker, sleep scientist here, with our growth hormone, repl replenishing the lining of your blood vessels called the endothelium here, and we've spoken about the endothelium there, they, they are shorn and stripped of their integrity, vessels rupture, heart attack and stroke become very common, and you've got hypertension. So we need growth hormone up, so we've got to fix our blood sugar 
and insulin resistance. And growth hormone does a lot of pretty cool things beyond that. It also helps you rip off the body fat here, builds muscle alongside testosterone, and it repairs the tissues and organs, prepares the tissues and organs, the brain, the heart, the blood vessels, as we just mentioned, the testes, the ovaries in women, the intestines, the gut, the kidneys, the muscles, including the smooth muscle of the penis, the cartilage and bone marrow, liver and central nervous system. So we got to fix the blood sugar. Now to the gut. Now this is absolutely huge. So if you don't have a healthy gut, we will suffer. All of these organ systems suffer. You've got an enteric nervous system in your gut, around about 600 million neurons. So the gut speaks to all of these organ systems, the brain, we're talking about stress, anxiety, depression, IBS, schizophrenia, cognitive decline, autism, brain fog, memory decline, dementia. Then the endocrine system, so all of your hormones are out of whack, testosterone, growth hormone. Then the heart, so this plays into blood flow again, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, thrombosis, thick, sludgy blood hypertension, reduced blood flow, as I keep mentioning, lungs, so you've got rhinitis, seasonal allergies, asthma, pulmonary disorders, liver, so you can't detox. And a lot of the detox for estrogen, keeping estrogen at healthy levels happens in the liver. Then we've got the pancreas, type 1, type 2 diabetes, then the bone, so your joints get sore and achy. Then your muscles, so it's very difficult to put on muscle mass right there. And as you age, you get frail sarcopenia. So who wants that? Now, this is where it gets very interesting because the skin, the skin is absolutely huge. You've got acne, cirrhosis, atopic dermatitis, but advanced wrinkles and aging, and this plays into alopecia. This is absolutely huge, and I'll show you this on the next slide. We've also got a gut gonad access. So the test is for dudes and the ovaries for women. Now think about that, all right? If you want a lot of testosterone, you want good sexual function, fertility, then we need to really fix the gut. Then we've also got the kidneys and bladder there. So a lot of people don't have a very good bladder. They could have a bit of pain urinating and frequent urinate, you know, going to the bathroom way too many times. So right here, this is the gut microbiome and the gut skin access here, alopecia. So if we don't fix the gut, we've got a big risk of going bald, losing our hair, but also you won't have thick, luscious hair as well. And as I've already spoken about, nutrient deficiencies there. So we've got to have great vitamin and mineral status. Now, another thing that I've learned from Dr. J, who did the five-year PhD in hormones, we can have different gut genetics. Some people have got remarkable gut genes and some people like me have terrible, and I mean terrible gut genes. And guess what? Right here, testosterone actually helps you lower inflammation in the gut in both men and women. So this is Dr. J just speaking about that. And incidentally, testosterone lowers inflammation when it's up at optimal levels in both men and women all over the body all over the body. Listen to this, Dr. J. Discs in the back, it goes back to testosterone. It probably has some low back stuff. This plus plus in the sheet, almost everybody complains low back pain and things. Yep. But it's all about testosterone to keep that at bay, to protect against future problems there. Testosterone, testosterone. How, how does testosterone do that? It shuts <laughs> off interleukins. And interleukins kind of like CRP. It's a form of inflammation. And there's 24 of them. There's IL-1, there's IL-2, there's IL-3, all those 24. And some of them are in your knees and some are in your elbows and some are in your discs and your back and some are in your right. brain. And so like this particular one, IL-1 alpha, it's called interleukin-1 alpha. It's in your discs in your low back. Yep. And it can get out of hand and just cause specific low back disc degeneration, disc pain, bulging discs and all this kind of stuff. If you have inflammation there all the time and testosterone shuts it off. So I guess testosterone would be a very powerful lever to pull down on to get rid of inflammation when it's up at the right yep, level. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. In general, yeah. especially in the low back, you know, <clears throat> that's why the drug companies hate it, right? Because if you have nice high <laughs> testosterone, 
it's going to heal a lot of chronic issues that they they're prescribing drugs for like arthritis and gut issues like ibs they have all these drugs for irritable bowel syndrome yeah you know yeah, yeah. it's just like on and on testosterone is like a magic trick to bring down mm -hmm. inflammation all over the body exactly, exactly. All right, so optimal testosterone for both men and women. And as you can see here, low testosterone, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cardiovascular, erectile. Then you've got inflammation. It's just an absolute mess and insulin resistance. And we've already spoken about chronic inflammation there and the blood labs. So you've got to get your high-sensitive CRP below one. As I mentioned there earlier, that's optimal. And in the current medical system, they'll say below three is okay or even below five. And when you, it's between one and three, you've got low-grade inflammation. So got to make sure you get your blood labs checked. Now, another thing that can drive into a very poor gut is what's called food sensitivities. Not to be mistaken with food allergies, that's completely different, food sensitivities. And this will interrupt your sleep, which is foundational for, you know, testosterone production a lot and energy as well. So food allergies are a big problem. Now, the way that these food allergies start to, to happen, as I learned when I went in through and did my certificate in nutrition, is that when you've got a food allergy, it can open up the tight junctions in your gut. Now, here is the problem. These food proteins go into the small intestine, the first chamber called the duodenum, and this inflammation opens them up and they, they're undigested food proteins. And this, this can be from plants as well. Plants have food proteins. So they go through systemically into circulation in the bloodstream there, and then the immune system sees it as a threat. So these undigested food particles called antigens there are tested out in what's called a macrophage. And then if it sees it as a threat, these T cells have a memory and it tags it as a threat. And every time you eat that food, within five minutes, the tight ju junctions open up and you've got that inflammation systemically there. And I plan on doing another video to show you how to fix the gut. And one thing that's really important to understand is that you can actually test for these food allergies, but the, the important thing to understand is that a lot of mainstream medicine, they just test for allergies, right? And this is IgE response. This is immediate, and you'll know right away that you've got a food allergy. And the problem becomes is that you can test for IgG, IgM, IgA, food sensitivities, and that's the real test for food sensitivities. Now, why is that really important? because these food sensitivities will just cause a tank in energy. They will start to open up the tight junctions and it's a delayed response, one to three days. So it doesn't show up immediately. So you eat these foods, even healthy, seemingly healthy foods, and it causes that delayed response, the tight junctions open up. And before you know it, you've got this inflammatory response. This inflammatory response just gets worse and worse over time. And the older you get, the worse it becomes. So another thing that we spoke about was iron overload. So I've spoken about iron overload there. So this goes back to the labs. And how do you fix iron overload? Very simply, you donate blood. And the remarkable thing about donating blood is it improves endothelial function and it also increases your enzymes for antioxidants like glutathione superoxide dismutase and catalase so it improves your endothelial cells and it also gives you a much more powerful antioxidant system on screen here is how we heal the gut so when i went through and did my certificate nutrition this is the the comprehensive way that we're going to do it so we protect the first line of defense here is the oral, lung, and skin microbiome. Then we've got to identify symptoms. And the way we do that is a GI map. And I'm going to do another video on this, a GI map or a food sensitivity test, and also the V8 labs, as I've mentioned there before. And then we have to enhance digestion, repair the gut, repopulate the right species, and also consider doing what's called a DNA-based nutrition 
working out your Trojan horses. So the Trojan horses, as I mentioned there, can be your inflammation. It can be your gut change. It can be all of those things. And I'll talk about that when I do another video on gut health here. But let's just quickly unpack the oral microbiome because this impacts nitric oxide production. So you've got a gut testy access, as we now know, but you've also got an oral microbiome. And this is one of the first lines of defense. So this is from Nathan S. Bryant. He's a PhD and all he researches is nitric oxide production. Listen to this video here. Have this effect? Absolutely. So here's what happens. And the advertisements are correct. It kills 99.99% of the bacteria when you use it. And that's the problem. That's the problem. I mean, the bacteria <laughs> that live in and on the human body outnumber on human cells 10 to 1. Right? So this is an entire ecology. We call this symbiosis. These bacteria providing metabolic benefits to the human host that we can't do. One of those is production of nitric oxide. So when you eradicate these bacteria... There's an entire ecology from the mouth all the way down to the anus, right? And it's the microbiome. A lot of people focused on the gut microbiome. Years ago, we focused on the oral microbiome. And what we found was that the more diverse the microbiome, the better cardiovascular health and the better blood pressure management. Hmm. So when you eradicate this with mouthwash, we saw, I think the first paper was in maybe 2009, 2010, you take normal intensive patients, you just put them on mouthwash twice a day for seven days, you see an increase in blood pressure. Damn. Now, this was an, this drove kind of cardiologists and, and vascular biologists crazy because they thought we, we thought we had a pretty good understanding of vascular biology and maintenance of systemic blood pressure. So how, by killing oral bacteria, we're affecting systemic blood pressure and vascular tone? And then we figured out, well, it's through the production of nitric oxide. So, yeah, alcohol-based mouthwash does this. The chlorhexidine prescription mouthwash uh, uh, is very effective at killing it. The good news is, and we published this in 2019, if you use mouthwash, we certainly see an increase in blood pressure. And I think in 2020, I was on the doctor show. We came in and we revealed that if you use mouthwash, you actually lose the protective benefits of exercise. Mm. So think about this. If you're trying to do all the right things, you're eating a good balanced diet, you're getting exercise, but if you're using mouthwash, you lose the entire cardiovascular benefits of everything you're doing. Hmm. The good news is four days after we stop using it, blood pressure normalizes. The bacteria will completely repopulate. So this is a resilient community. That he also mentioned that fluoride does the same thing. It kills the microbiome in your mouth as well. So as you can see there, the whole way to protect the gut is comprehensive, but it needs to be done. And everybody has different genetics as well. So if you really want to just think through this in a logical manner, as I'll just go back up to this slide here, the Omega Index is going to help protect you. The blood labs are going to show you where you busted inside, and then you can start correcting those and moving towards optimal ranges, functional ranges there. And that's going to pick up all your hormones. Remember, testosterone lowers inflammation throughout the whole body when we bring it back up. Gut health is foundational or vitamin and mineral status is going to play into it, and food sensitivities are absolutely huge. So you can do testing for this, and I'm going to speak about that when I do another video on gut health there. So if you think about what's really going on there, you don't need to take lotions and potions for your hair, medoxid, all those things. If you're healthy, you should keep your hair for a very long time, and it's going to have massive health benefits. It's going to increase your testosterone, your muscle growth, you, it'll help you lose the body fat. It's going to give you more energy and it's going to make you feel alive. You know what I mean? So if you find these videos helpful, help me out, share this video, like it, and join the conversation below. And yeah, we can do a lot better than what you know, the system is basically indoctrinated into us. So there's a lot of performance that's we're missing out on, you know, we're told that as we age, we decline, but, but do we really, is that, the, you know, do we really decline? Can we improve our health? Well, absolutely. And as you can see here, you've got to really fix your blood sugar because you don't want atherosclerosis. You don't want reduced blood flow to tissues and organs, especially hair follicles, if you want to keep your hair. So we can certainly do a lot better. And that's about it. So whether you're, Want to keep your hair, whether you don't, that's entirely up to you. It's too late for me. My hair follicles died off a long time ago. So 
I don't really care about not having hair, but each to their own. So that's it for today, and I'll see you on the next video.